All right. Thanks again for joining us. Um, uh, my name is Dan Parrish. I'm the Vice President for College Advancement at Colby Sawyer College. We're excited to have so many of you joining us from here in New London and in New Hampshire and from all over the country. Right now we have, let me just update the number, we've got about uh, 90 of you with us in the room and we really appreciate you joining us. I'm going to turn on Sue's camera and uh, unmute her, uh, her uh, microphone so that she can join us here. Um, so let me see if uh, I can make this, make this work. And there she is. There's President Stubner joining us from, we're, we're across the street from each other here today. Um, we're really fortunate to have Sue with us today to talk about the college's response to the coronavirus pandemic and to answer your questions about what's happening at Colby Sawyer now and about our plans moving forward. Before I hand things over to Sue to begin her presentation, I'd like to review the format for the webinar and go over some of the details of the Zoom platform that we are using for today's discussion. We are recording this webinar and we will share a link uh, to the recording uh, in the next few days after we're done today. Uh, as participants today, your microphones and video feeds are disabled, but you can let us know if you're having a hard time seeing us or hearing us by typing in the text chat. Uh, you can also submit any new questions that you'd like to ask Sue in the chat, or you can submit them using the question and answer function, and I will keep track of them. Sue will make a presentation today and use a set of slides, and then afterwards we'll take, uh, I'll share your questions with her. We received many, many, many questions in advance, so uh, I'll be tracking those as well, and um, any that Sue doesn't address during her presentation, we'll try to get to as many of those as, as we can. To find the chat or the Q&A, if, you, if you're not seeing it on your screen, just move your cursor, or if you're on a mobile device, just touch the mobile device, and you'll see the chat and question and answer functions at the bottom of the screen, and you can use them there. A bunch of you are, are sending messages to, uh, to me and to Sue right now, and um, so I know most of you have figured out how to use it, and um, thanks so much for joining us. It's great to see so from many familiar names in the, in the room right now. Um, I'm going to hand things off to Sue. Sue, we have about 95 people with us right now, uh, and I'll let you take over. Great. Thanks so much, Dan, and uh, thanks so much to all of you for coming. It's really wonderful to have alumni and friends and neighbors. I know we also have some parents and some students on the, on the Zoom today as well, and and to our students, I'll just tell you, um, we miss you terribly. This place is just completely different without you. So I'm um, sure the, the locals, uh, the neighbors on the, uh, the Zoom would, would attest to that as well. I wanna start by just acknowledging that I know that COVID-19 has really affected all of us in one way or another. Um, I know that there's a great deal of stress that our faculty, staff, and students are feeling. Um, and I know that many of you have been affected in different ways as well. So thanks for taking some time out of your day to, to hear a little bit about Colby Sawyer College. Um, I also know that we've got some folks on the call today that um, are on the front lines, whether they're healthcare workers or teachers or volunteers in their community and so many people that are working to try to help get us to the other side of this. And so thank you very much for all that you do. As Dan said, I do have just a few slides um, and then I want to leave plenty of time for, for discussion and questions. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the college's response to COVID-19, uh, an enrollment update, a little bit about our finances, um, and looking ahead to this coming fall and how we're approaching planning for uh, the fall semester and, and for our next academic year, and then we'll leave plenty of time for questions. So just a couple milestones in terms of the decision-making process. If we think back to early March, um, as we were getting ready to have our students go on spring break, um, our real focus at that point in time, as the virus was really at that point um, more abroad than it was in the United States, um, was really the safety of our students studying abroad. And we did have two students that were studying in Italy through another program. And so our our biggest focus at that point was just getting the students back to the U.S. safely and helping them navigate um, finishing their studies through their program so that they could uh, finish out the semester. 
Um, we then uh, went on spring break and um, March 13th, we made the decision um, to extend spring week, spring break by an extra week um, and go to remote learning through early April. And what happened during that extra week of spring break was really the faculty worked very hard for that week, converting their syllabi from face-to-face -to, -face to online delivery. And they did a lot of training sessions for each other, um, different modalities that each of them knew some better than others. And um, our IT team was really um, involved a great deal as well in helping them learn Zoom and other ways that they could um, navigate this process with their students. And so then we started uh, with online learning and um, unfortunately on the 25th of March, it became clear that this was not gonna go away quickly and that the April deadline was a little bit too ambitious. So we did extend the distance learning through the remainder of the semester. Um, also right around that same time, um, we made the decision to postpone commencement until August 8th. We felt it was really important to try to have an actual ceremony for our seniors, and we knew that early May was going to not, probably not be realistic, um, also due to the virus. Um, so those were the kind of the key milestones in our decision making process. Just a couple quick slides on kind of how the students are experiencing this process so far. We did recently send out a survey and um, asked the students a couple questions. We had about 300 students respond and they're pretty evenly distributed between the four different class years. And this one was about um, if you did not have adequate access to the internet, did you feel your faculty member work with you on that situation? Um, and about 70% of our students did feel like they had adequate access to internet. Um, and about 21% felt their faculty did work with them if they did not. But this was a real concern for us going into distance learning. We do have a lot of students that live in remote areas. Um, we have a lot of students who are sharing a household right now with siblings who are learning online or parents that might be teaching online. Um, and so we wanted to be sure that um, faculty were working with those students. Um, we also just asked if, if faculty had been responsive in general um, when students were communicating their needs. This is a, not only brand new for our faculty, but also a new way of learning for our students. Um, and about 73% felt that the faculty members had been responsive and another 26% felt somewhat. So overall, a pretty good experience. We asked the same question in terms of our staff and our support areas, and it also really strong support here. About 82% felt that our support areas had been really responsive when they communicated their needs. So even though we were all doing this from our homes um, and separate from one another, um, we were pleased to see for the most part that students' needs were being met. So I wanna give you just a little bit of an update on enrollment. And the first is to talk about incoming students. Um, our goal for this year is 250 first year students um, and 25 transfer. And one of the biggest changes that have had to come through all of this is that um, this is a time when most students are visiting campus to make their final decisions. And instead of having that option, um, we really had to go virtual for just about everything. Excuse me, one second. Accepted Students Day is one of our biggest days in terms of yielding students, um, and that's in early April. And so we had to go virtual. Um, we know that we had 128 students and 62 parents attend through an email invite. We can track um, who opened the email invite and went to the page. And the page that was created for Accepted Students Day had nearly 900 click-throughs with an average time of about five minutes. Um, it's really a wonderful site. It's actually on our banner right now. Um, it's a series of videos that shows everything from academic advising to social life and a student panel, um, financial aid, athletics, academic support services, just about everything that you could think of a question that you might have if you were visiting campus 
we had a video that had showcased the different people of Colby Sawyer, which we think is one of our strengths. And so families and students had the opportunity to click on these different videos. Um, we've seen a lot of traffic since it's been up. It wasn't just that day that folks went to it. So it's been a really helpful tool for us. And we think a reason why we're still seeing um, some really good trends in our deposit activity. <coughs> Excuse me, speaking of deposit activity, um, we have delayed our decision date to June 1st. Um, it's typically May 1st is when students have to make a decision about whether or not they're gonna attend a school. But uh, Colby Sawyer, like many institutions, has extended it to June 1st, um, just to give families a little bit more time amidst this really chaotic and uncertain environment. And then what we're focused on is really a number of virtual tools to help students. Um, they can speak with an admission counselor via Zoom. They can sign up for individual time slots. Um, we did small group sessions for Know Your Major. Um, and then we are also offering something called Tea on Tuesdays, which will continue in the spring into the summer and focus on a number of different areas um, to help students who have chosen Colby Sawyer to get a sense of who we are, um, as well as to help those who haven't chosen us yet and get a and hopefully give them a better sense of who we are. In addition to the students coming in, we're also paying a lot of attention um, to our returning students, um, and in particular, our first year students. If you think about it, first year students, um, they, the first time they've gone through course registration for the fall, or the first time that they've gone through the housing selection process, um, and so we've had a lot of resources where we've tried to reach out to those first year students and help them with the disruption of their first year. Um, we had a great uh, staff initiative where over 40 staff volunteers um, reached out up to five first year students um, just to engage them around social issues and to help um, complement faculty advising that was going on about academic registration. Um, our students got involved, um, our orientation leaders were reaching out to first year students, as well as our student government had a question and answer session on Instagram um, the week of course registration, just to answer some how to how to questions that again first year students might usually be able to walk down their residence hall hallway and ask a friend or ask an upperclassman, um, but now we need to do this all virtually. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit to financial matters. Um, I, I don't know of any kind of business industry right now that hasn't been hit hard in some way um, by COVID-19 and, and Colby Sawyer is not um, immune from it at all either. And I know a lot of families and individuals have also um, been affected. For Colby Sawyer, the, one of the primary um, ways that it's hit us is a loss of auxiliary revenue. Um, Gordon Research Conferences is a conference of scientists that comes for 11 weeks in the summertime. They've been coming since 1947. This is the first so summer that they won't be able to come because of the COVID virus. Um, and in total that along with Hogan and Wendy Hill and the pub um, is about a million dollars of lost revenue. Um, we also gave a room and board refund to our students um, for the time that they were not on campus at the end of the spring semester. And that was about a $1.25 million cost to the college. We have been really aggressive in trying to take advantage of the federal stimulus and state funding opportunities. Um, we were really pleased to, with our partner, Bar Harbor Bank, um, be approved for a PPP, the Payroll Protection Program for 2.65 million. Um, that covers our payroll for eight weeks and has played a significant role in our ability not to have to lay anyone off at the college at, during this really difficult time. We also just received half of the CARES Act funding, which is from the Department of Education. And the 50% that we've received will actually go to students who've uh, filled out a FAFSA form. Um, each of them will receive um, a grant that will be coming in the next couple weeks. Um, so we're really pleased that we were able to get um, and participate in some of those programs. 
Looking ahead to this fall, um, we're trying to build a budget um, with a lot of unknowns. Um, we, again, think deposits are tracking well, um, but we just don't know what might change over the summer. So we're looking at three different um, scenarios in terms of size. And then we're also looking at a scenario in case we have to start um, online again, um, rather than start in person. Um, and to budget, to, to balance the budget, um, we're just really exploring all budget levers. The staff is working really hard with budget managers in terms of potential savings. Um, and we have a, a board meeting coming up in two weeks where we'll have some discussion with the board about some levers that they control as well. And lastly, just looking ahead towards planning for the fall. You know, in a perfect world, we hope to reopen Hogan by July 1st. Um, this will be completely contingent upon what's happening in the state and, you know, the guidelines from the CDC and, and others. Um, but our hope is that by July 1st, we will be able to reopen Hogan. Um, in terms of fall 2020 scenarios, um, we're looking at a variety of different things. Um, you know, best case, we, we open up on time and all of our students are able to be here on campus with us. Um, we're also looking at pushing back the start date to an October 1 start um, or the possibility of having to open with distance learning. Even if our students are able to join us, um, we know that there will likely still need to be some social distancing. So we're looking at um, ways that we can spread them out in classrooms. Um, we might have to do shifts in the dining hall. Um, a lot of different factors that we're talking about in order, if we, in order to have students on campus, what are the kinds of steps that we would likely have to take in order to make that a reality. Um, the availability of testing will be a really important thing in, here in New London or at our own health center. Um, and our housekeepers who have done a great job um, prior to the students leaving, um, getting trained on kind of uh, really specific types of cleaning to help protect the campus, um, will certainly have emphasis on that as well. So that was aimed to be just a real broad overview. Um, and now I'm really would be delighted to take your questions. Thanks so, thanks so much, Sue. We've had a few questions come in um, through the chat. And of course, we had a lot of questions beforehand. A um, couple, couple of questions just early on that, that had come in early. You just talked about our return in the fall. And one person um, before the webinar had asked if we we would consider testing students as they return or um, or keeping you know keeping the campus in some way not necessarily quarantine but there were a couple questions about what we might do to control when we do return control student travel and uh, you know i think we've we've we're considering lots of scenarios i'm not sure there are any clear answers to these but um just a few initial thoughts on those on those questions yeah, we, we definitely know that testing will be a big part of the process. You know, I don't know that we can mandatory test every student, but, um, you know, we want to be sure that testing is available. Um, we've also talked about just the ability to take students' temperatures or other faculty and staff temperatures, just because that's one of the um, key uh, criteria for the virus. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of unknowns at this point. Um, we, we've gone as far as talked about maybe putting students all in single rooms, um, and we can do that for about all except for 100 students. Um, so we're talking about a variety of things, and you know, we're going to be working really closely. We have an, a, an um, incident response team that actually um, has a health professional on it, as well as our director of campus safety, and they work very closely with state officials um, in health and human resources, as well as um, just general safety. And they will really give us some guidance on what are the conditions under which we can even realistically think about having students on campus. There were a couple of questions about summer programs and events, and you mentioned um, the Hogan um, the Hogan Athletic Center. Um, there were a couple of questions just about, are there any summer programs that we still have planned for this summer? Um, 
I know there are a couple things we're, we're yet to make decisions on, but um, I, I don't know if you, you know, have an answer to, to, we haven't canceled all summer programs yet, but we're, we're sort of taking that day by day right now, I think is the answer, but. Yeah, we're really just kind of taking it a week at a time here to see what information that we gather and, you know, and how things open up and, and when we get to the other side of this curve. Um, you know, we're certainly extremely hopeful that we can have commencement on August 8th. I think that's probably, you know, the main event that we're trying to, to shoot for having, you know, other programming at this point. Um, we're, we're hesitant to make a commitment because we don't want to have to then pull back. Um, so we'll, we'll try to make decisions on things that are still unsettled just as soon as we can. Um, but we just really... I think the hardest thing about this has been information changes. Um, for a while there, it felt like it was changing hourly, <laughs> um, right. but it's certainly certainly changing, you know, day by day, week by week. And so um, we'll we'll try to be as responsive as we can. Yep. Just I'm going to move chronologically through a couple questions here, so it might seem a little, seem a little uh, random, <laughs> but but um, we had both before before the. Um, webinar began and now we've received a couple of questions about um, whether we still anticipate um, having students come back to move their their um, possessions out in May. I heard you answer this question a couple times yesterday, but I'll, I'll let you answer it again uh, for this crowd. Yeah, no, we, you know, uh, right now students are um, scheduled or are able to pick times between May 4th and May 18th. Um, you know, the, the governor has not given us any guidance yet about the stay at home order um, continuing after May 4th, other than, other than foreshadowing it'll likely extend beyond that. Um, we know we will probably need to extend the move out beyond May into June, not just for um, the stay at home order, but also just to accommodate students from other states who may have um, a no travel ordinance right now and may need a longer time to be able to get up here. So um, the main thing is just to, for those that are wondering about this, is to really keep a close eye on email for, for communications from residents life. Um, again, as soon as we know something, we will be communicating as, as quickly as we possibly can. Um, but we have set up the move out in a way that limits the number of people that come each day. Um, we'll be asking people to wear masks. We'll be limiting how many people can um, come with a student to move out. Um, and we would have housekeeping on hand to be doing, you know, a thorough clean between, um, between the students' visits. So that's, that's the plan. It's just a matter of when we can do it. Great. Um, we had a couple of questions both beforehand and, and, and in, the, um, in the chat about uh, homecoming and reunion. Um, our good friend Ann Baines Hall asked whether we thought homecoming <laughs> would happen. Uh, your friend Patty Calhoun, Calhoun also asked. Uh, Sam has just asked about that as well. I think yeah. the answer is like the other answers, but I'll let you, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you weigh in on that. Yeah, I would certainly hope by the time that um, homecoming is, is scheduled to be that we'll be able to gather and, you know, it, um, we may have to gather in slightly different ways and, and have smaller group sessions or um, spread out and, you know, I'm not sure exactly how it's going to look, but I certainly hope by October that we'll be able to, to go forth with, with such an important weekend. Um. Somebody asked about the CARES Act money, and um, I think I, I think we haven't um, determined exactly how that will be the the portion of the CARES Act money that goes to students. There's a lot of work to be done to figure out exactly how that goes. But one of the questions was basically whether um, that money is already represented in awards that students have received, financial aid updates and financial aid scholarship awards, or whether that information is still to come. I think the answer is that it's still to come, but I wanted to confirm that. Yeah, we just got some clarity on that. Um, actually, within the last 48 hours, there was some um, guidance from the Department of Education that's helped us really understand how we can use that money. Um, it is not reflected in students' financial aid packages right now, so it will be something above and beyond that. Um, we hope to have letters, and it'll actually be 
a check that goes to students who file the FAFSA and we will be sending those out probably in three to four weeks. There are a number of questions, different questions that came in beforehand and that are coming in in the, um, in the chat about the plans for the fall and the, the there, there's a number of different kind of ways that it's worded, but the, the possibility that there might be a mix of online classes and in-person classes or a start with online delivery and just, you know, um, questions about that. And I, I think we don't yet, you know, we don't yet know, but I, um, I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about um, how those decisions will be made. We, you know, that, yeah. that there, is a, there is a group of people beginning to unpack this and, and maybe just describe that process a little bit because as you said, it, it's, we're not quite still in the time when it changes hour to hour, but every day, day or so, things seem to be completely different. And so just that I know you've got a group of people looking at that. We, we, we actually have two different groups looking at it. Um, we have a group that's really looking at it from an academic and a residential standpoint. Um, we have to have so many weeks or so many contact hours in a semester. And so one group is looking at what would it mean to change the academic calendar and push it back a bit so that we have a later start with a better likelihood that students could actually return to campus. Um, we've heard from a lot of students in addition to, from, to our faculty who've told us this spring that they would really prefer to be learning face-to-face -face. and so there's a group that's looking at the, the academic and residential life components of, of what would make that possible. Um, and then we also have the, the incident response team that I mentioned, and um, they're really coming at this from more of an emergency management standpoint of, um, you know, where, where does the virus need to be at that point in time? You know, what kind of testing needs to be available? Um, what kind of space for quarantine might we need to have? What kind of restrictions might we need to put on students as well as faculty and staff? Um, in order to, to pull it off. Um, so there's a lot of different questions that we're looking at. Um, we, there are some schools, especially down in Boston and New York that have already made decisions or are gonna be making them in May. Um, I would expect that we will probably not make a decision until July, um, just so that we have as much information as possible before we make this kind of decision for the start. Got to remember to unmute myself. Sorry about that. Um, I'm, I'm going to shift to a different set of questions, but I just to piggyback on what you just said about the timing for our decision making. Um, many, uh, many of the folks in the chat will recognize the name Doug Lyon, who, uh, in addition to being a longtime uh, employee and friend of Colby Sawyer College, is the board chair of New London Hospital. And he, you know, one of the one of the things that's a little different about our decision making timeline compared to Massachusetts is um, Doug just sent Sue and I a message that says um, New London has not experienced any significant number of positive COVID-19 patients. Um, he, Doug says we have two right now. We have a, we have a number of folks who are self-isolating, but not, not significant, significant serious cases. So our timeline is a little different than, than maybe the population south of us. Um, because we're we're relatively safe at the moment, and I understand that relatively safe is probably not the right way to put it, but that it is a little different than other places right now. Right. There, Sue, so there are a couple um, questions uh, again, some that have been in the full chat, and some that have just come in directly to me um, about faculty and classes. And we're in the last week of classes, so we're we're a little past some of this. But there are a number of folks, students and parents, who've um, asked. Why we, uh, why we didn't require faculty to hold to, um, synchronous classes at the, at the time that their class, all faculty at the time that their class normally would, would have met. Why, why we didn't require faculty to hold live classes. Um, there's, a, there's a number of different questions about students' particular circumstances, but I don't know if you have a, just a quick comment on that um, or, or response to that, that question. Yeah, we, again, that week of spring break when we were um, really training um, faculty to go from face-to-face -to, -face to online, um, you know, we gave faculty the choice to really, you know, they had the opportunity to learn Zoom, they had the opportunity to, to record the, their lectures, um, 
you know, some folks felt doing things by email was the best way for them to do their, their particular course. Um, we did leave it mostly up to faculty um, to, to determine what was best for the content in their course, as well as um, for how, who they are as individuals. So, um, you know, I know there was some disappointment um, by some students that not every single faculty member did Zoom, for example, because we heard that that was a pretty effective way. Um, it not only did have the content delivered, but also to, to see your classmates and to have that social interaction. Um, but we really had to, we had to make these changes incredibly fast. And so we really left it up to the faculty member to determine the best way for them to deliver their content. And um, Laura Sykes, who's the Vice President for um, Academic uh, Affairs, has um, just uh, written me a note. And oh, my chat is moving so quickly I can't read her note. Uh, she just said some students couldn't participate in synchronous classes because they, because of basically the other commitments, taking care of siblings, sharing computing resources with family. So I know that, that there were for some faculty members and some students, that was a, a challenge and not wanting to sort of leave students out of that live, that live class experience. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna shift to a, a, just a completely different set of questions. Um, ha our, our alum, Happy Griffiths, and a couple of other folks, Pete Rucci, who's Peter Rucci, who's a neighbor down the street, um, asked whether um, our senior nurses have been able to either, um, there were a couple questions about graduating early. So many people have seen the news stories about medical students graduating early in New York and Boston in particular, um, and whether any of our senior nurses, stu nursing students have accelerated out to be able to get into the workforce more quickly. Um, you and I talked a little bit about that earlier today. You wanna um, share what you, you shared with me earlier? Sure, yeah, I, I, I talked with our chair of nursing about this because this question came up um, to me last week by um, an alum and, um, uh, you know, the Massachusetts has um, had some schools and I believe the University of Vermont has graduated some nurses early in order to go down to Massachusetts to help. Um, for us, it wasn't as, I guess, two things. One, we, we didn't have any requests from our partner, um, Dartmouth-Hitchcock, um, for nurses to, to graduate early. And, and in talking with our chair of nursing, it would really take a coordinated effort between the hospital and the school to graduate students early. Um, otherwise, they might be down there as student nurses um, and then end up being behind rather than being able to graduate. Um, there's some pretty, pretty prescriptive accreditation requirements in terms of the number of hours that they have to have and um, we weren't able to accelerate those. So um, our students are um, right now doing a lot of their clinical work virtually um, after having done most of it at Dartmouth-Hitchcock um, and they um, won't be able to, to accelerate and, and graduate early. Um, uh, you were on the, for those of you who aren't in New Hampshire, we have this uh, New Hampshire public radio program uh, here called The Exchange. You were on The Exchange earlier this week and you, you talked about what the accrediting organization has done to adjust clinical requirements. Um, you want to just you know, mention that as well? Uh, as well? Sure, well, there's usually a, um, a limitation on how many hours that nursing students can um, do clinical hours virtually versus, again, face-to-face. -face. And in light of COVID-19, um, CCNE, the, the accrediting body, um, did allow for more hours to be delivered virtually. So again, our, our seniors um, should be on track to graduate because they've been able to um, uh, extend those hours that they're learning virtual clinicals right now. Great. Um, I'm trying to keep up with all the questions in the in the chat here. Um, I want to. Uh, we received a really nice note from somebody affiliated with New London Hospital who wants to thank us, for, thank the college for um, the college's support and the uh, donations that we've made and uh, the, the just the community connection. So thank you for that comment. We appreciate it. Um, uh, let me just. There was a question. Um, 
couple of questions. There was an early question from, um, again, our alumna, Ann Baines Hall. She sent it in beforehand, and I think somebody else um, asked a question. Oh, a question about how alumni can help. And I have a couple of comments about that, but um, you have any immediate immediate thoughts about um, the ways that the ways that alumni can can help students as, as they're navigating all of this and help the college? Well, I think there's two pressure points right now for our students, especially our seniors and our juniors. And they, our juniors are, um, you know, in the middle of looking for internships this summer and um, with in an area of great uncertainty. And um, while they might not be able to do a face-to-face -face internship, if there's any any assistance you can give our current students on just connecting with companies who might be able to do remote projects, um, uh, that would be an enormous help because the internship is such a, a crucial part of our education and um, it's going to be a tricky summer to get that in for a lot of students. Um, likewise, our seniors face a really challenging um, job market right now. And so again, if if there are openings or if you, you know if there are leads um, or just even informational interviews that you can help facilitate um, those things are especially helpful to our students i believe great i i will just say uh it's an opportune time to ask about the job and internship question because tomorrow we're sending out an email um to all alumni and actually to to others as well. Um, that email is announcing a, a day of support and a fundraising effort, but part of it is inviting alumni or anybody to email us and let us know if you belong to an organization that has internship opportunities or job opportunities. And Jennifer Talkman, who runs the Harrington Center um, for Career Development, um, we she, she and I have talked about this and we will funnel uh, anything that comes into us to Jen, and if there are questions that we have, um, our staff will follow up to see if there's, you know, any anything that we need to find out about requirements or anything like that. So keep your eye on your email tomorrow. And then in response to the, the question about how alumni can help in general, um, we have lined up uh, a number of alumni, the admissions office has lined up a number of alumni to help with panels um, coming up. Um, Sue mentioned that we're doing these these panels for um, admitted students. So there are a number of alumni helping with that. Um, our Director of Alumni and Community Relations, Tracy Austin, will be reaching out to our President's Alumni Advisory Council with some more information, uh, hopefully in the next week or so, just about you know, possible, other possible opportunities. So we will we'll keep an eye out for our colleagues on campus who might need help, um, not just on the job and career front, but on the retention front and um, other places. So we'll, I appreciate the, the question and we'll, uh, we'll try to keep communicating about that. Thank you very much. Yeah, one other um, thought too, one yeah. other thought too, Dan. Um, you know, I know that COVID has hit um, each of us in a lot of different ways, but for those that are able and have the interest, um, we did create a student emergency fund um, that for students who've been impacted by COVID and, and that would just be another way um, to potentially help our students. Right, great. Um, so there, there were a couple of questions um, today and before uh, it, it, it's a little, it sounds a little opportunistic to, to give you this question, but people have asked it, so I'm gonna ask. Um, a couple of people asked about our relationship with Dartmouth-Hitchcock and about, sure. uh, about the expansion of nursing and health sciences programs. And the questions range from, um, you know, either just comments that it seems more important now than ever that we've made this change, but also just whether, whether the current situation, A, impacts our relationship with Dartmouth-Hitchcock positively or negatively at all, and then, um, you know, how it's made you think about the, the move that we're making. Will it influence um, the speed that we expand any of these programs or the way we bring any of these programs on? No, thank you for the question. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think the health sciences are gonna be more important than ever, um, you know, during and after this crisis. And um, the, the interest that we have had in nursing this year has just been off the charts. We uh, had a goal of 80 new nurses to be coming to, to Colby Sawyer this fall, and we're already at 78, um, you know, with six weeks to go until the June 1st deadline. So 
Um, we're seeing just incredible interest in, in nursing and in the health science fields. Um, we've had a great conversation with our partner Dartmouth Hitchcock last week just about some of the milestones that we're supposed to be hitting and um, we're, we're hitting our marks and you know I know they're they're eager for um, our graduates to be able to get up there and help um, and I think that you know we'll, we'll certainly be taking a, a close look at programming um, one of the the programs that um, we'll be taking to the board in two weeks is an accelerated uh, nursing degree um, for students. It's more of a kind of uh, post baccalaureate path to a nursing degree for for undergraduates, um, and that's that'd be something new for us. So, um, in addition to the five new programs that we added earlier this fall, so I think it's going to be more relevant than ever, and um, you know I feel that it's really going to be a point of distinction to help Colby Sawyer through this period of time. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to do a little rapid fire through a few questions that have come through <laughs> and they, they may not at all be related to each other. We'll just bounce okay. from, from, uh, bounce from one to the, to the other. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to start with commencement. Um, sure. uh, somebody had submitted beforehand and she just followed up to ask, um, do you have any uh, any plans on what on what commencement will look like on August yep. 8th when we hold it? Um, will people wear cap and gowns? Will there be a <laughs> ceremony? Will it look like commencement is the question. Yes. <laughs> our absolute hope is that it'll look like commencement. Um, in fact, our, we have a, a group of professionals on campus that are working with the senior class officers, um, our student senior class officers to basically build a two day um, series of events so that we would still have our scholars and leaders program which is our award ceremony the nursing pinning um, a, a dinner for families um, and then commencement and at, by all means it would be um, a, a ceremony with caps and gowns and diplomas and and, and definitely a bagpiper because I'm a, a sucker for bagpipers um, um, <laughs> You know, we may, again, depending on where the virus is, we may find ourselves in a situation where students are limited on how many um, family members are able to be directly under the tent. We may have to space people out, um, but we live stream and we would have people, we would have multiple places on campus where the rest of families could go to see their loved one get their diploma on via live stream. There may be some restrictions like that. Um, you know, but we will we'll have a ceremony. Um, uh, that's the plan. Great. We had a we had a neighbor ask us before the webinar um, by um, who submitted a question in advance about we for those of you who are not here locally, we've had to put up a few signs down on the Kelsey Athletic Campus and the fields. Um, uh, asking folks to, to not access them. Um, I know that wasn't a decision you wanted to make, but I, I wanted to ask the question. Somebody said, why are those signs up and why can't we, why can't we be out there on the fields right now? Yeah, unfortunately, it was a really hard decision that we had to make. Um, but unfortunately, we had some young folks that were um, congregated uh, playing pickup games down on the fields and you know putting themselves at danger and putting you know just a safety risk and so um, we really did not want to put our safety or safety officers in the position of having to decide who they could say yes to and who they could say no to and so unfortunately at least Right now, while there's the stay-at-home order, um, we felt it was the prudent thing to do to close the fields. Um, you know, hopefully, um, as the weather improves and um, this thing lifts a little bit, we'll 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 certainly change that as soon as we we think we have enough information that we can. Um, another community question. Um, I'm not sure if this person needs follow-up. I, I hope they'll email me or email alumni at colbysawyer.edu to let me know if they need a hand with something. Somebody asked if there was child care available for um, essential workers and critical care folks uh, in New London, and I know the answer to the question, but I'm going to let you answer it. You mean it in terms of Windy Hill? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yes. So, um, yeah, Windy Hill is is still currently open, um, and the, the primary reason that it's open is is to um, serve those essential employees. And I, I think there may be one other facility. There was one other facility in town open. I don't know if it still is, but if the person who asked that question needs uh, a hand with that, you know, you can email me at alumni at colbysawyer.edu and we'll track down, you know, the, the on-campus information for you if you, if you need it. Um, there's, a, there's a question about um, Colby Sawyer remaining open and integrated with the community. And I don't, I don't know that we have an answer to this yet, but I know our hope is to, but um, the question was basically, you know, we, we have adventures in learning, uh, adult learners who come and join us in the dining hall right now. Uh, the Hogan Athletic Center has about five or 600 local community members who are, who are members and who participate. And um, I don't know if you have, you know, thoughts on what that, what that might look like six months from now or a few months from now. I'm not, I'm not sure we have a clear answer, but the question was whether we, you know, we, we intend to remain open to the community. Our, our, certainly our intention is to, re, you know, to remain open to the community. Our, our partnership with New London and all the different organizations you just mentioned, Dan, are, are um, critically important to us. I think, you know, again, I, I truly wish I had a crystal ball so I could, could let you know when we things are going to ease and we can and start to, um, you know, look forward to welcoming people back on campus. Um, you know, even even I am working at home, despite living across the street from campus. It's a um, it's a very odd time right now for um, you know for the campus to be empty and and not used. And um, we certainly want to get back to normalcy as soon as we have, um, you know, the, the information that we can. So, um, again, the, I'm sure that as we open Hogan or as um, folks come to the dining hall, that at first there likely will be some restrictions in place that we're all going to have to adhere to. Um, but what those look like, I just don't know yet. Uh, again, I'm, I'm sort of bouncing from one topic to the other, but... Um... <laughs> Um, somebody asked uh, whether we consider a, a four plus one kind of degree in public health or health sciences. Um, so I'll just leave the question at that because I know there are lots of other programs being developed and there is a four one option being developed in business, but whether we're looking at that as an option, sort of a four one masters in public health and health sciences. Yeah, that one is not currently on our list. It's, it's, um, Certainly one we could potentially take a look at. Um, Kevin Finn, our new Dean of the School of Nursing and Health Sciences, um, has a pretty uh, ambitious plan for some, some new um, academic programs. And, and there are certainly, some of them are at the master's and even down the road, potentially a doctoral level. Um, so it's not without the realm of reason that we might consider something like that. Um, but right now that's, that's not one on the near term list. Um, Phil Hunter early on, earlier on asked a question uh, in response to one of your slides. You mentioned that um, Colby Sawyer has extended the admissions reply deadline to June 1, and I just want to note that m all, almost every single one of our peers has done the same thing. Not, not all colleges and universities across the country, but, but many, many colleges have extended the deadline to June 1, and Phil wondered if we had a sense um, of how things are tracking compared to last to, to past years, knowing that it, it's going to be unusual because we're out to June 1. Uh, I know we have a, a pretty good sense of strong response in some areas, and we don't, we don't have exact numbers, can't track it against last year because of the May dead, 1 deadline, but whether you have a, just a, a response to sort of how things are looking, given that we've got still six more, five and a half weeks more to, to go out to June 1. Yeah, it's definitely, you know, actually the period between uh, March 15th and March 30th, we had more deposits in that period than we did um, any of the previous four years um, prior. Uh, so even with all the, the COVID uncertainty at that moment in time, um, we had really nice deposit activity. Um, things slow down just a, just a hair um, the next kind of 15 days. Um, right now we're seeing really nice steady um, 
steady volume coming in. It's kind of slow and steady wins the race, but um, we we feel good about meeting our goal and um, our, um, you know, especially with the time frame that we have with a little bit more time for families to make those decisions. One of, one of the things we've, uh, one of the things that the admissions team and the communications and marketing team have done since the virtual events that we had. So as Sue said, we had a, a virtual admitted student house, student open house in early April, and I shared the link to that in the chat. We also did a virtual uh, nursing tour and explore program that had great video content and uh, Kevin Finn and Joan Loftus from uh, the School of Nursing and Health Sciences held a question and answer session. But since that time, um, the admissions counselors are holding one-on-one -on -one sessions with students. Faculty are doing one-on-one -on -one, um, sort of pre-advising Q and A's. I talked to a, a faculty member yesterday who I think had done five or six of them so far and said it was really great because students are asking really good questions about when to take classes and, and sort of what comes next. And then as I mentioned, we've, uh, and as Sue mentioned, we have um, panels that are happening each of the next uh, three or four Tuesdays um, with admitted students as well. So there's a lot of activity there to kind of keep them engaged and answering questions and, and lots, of good, lots of good information going out and, um, and, and you know, reaching students. We're just at about 625 um, and I haven't had to talk as much as Sue has, and I know how tiring it can be to be on camera. So we're going to wrap up pretty soon. Um, uh, we uh, we've had lots of lots of really good comments and questions, a um, lot of really good um, information coming in. I'm sorry that I wasn't able to keep up with all of it and uh, able to. Um, to, to uh, answer all the questions. We just got a really nice message from Kevin Kelly that says um, he appreciates the good info and stay safe and go Chargers. So I appreciate that, <laughs> that sentiment. Sue, I don't know if there are any, um, any, I shouldn't put you on the spot like this without warning you, but any uh, last points you wanna make or anything that you wanna sort of round out or remind people of? I would just again thank folks for coming out this this evening. Um, you know, we really appreciate your interest. Um, you know, I, I feel confident that Colby Sawyer is going to find its way through this crisis. We've got an amazing board of trustees with a lot of great thinkers, and um, we've got great people in in every constituency. So. Um, we will find our way through this and um, you know I think as we talked about a little bit earlier our focus on the health sciences gives us a real opportunity to distinguish ourselves um, once we get on the other side of this so um, really appreciate everyone's time this evening and um, uh, your care and engagement with this very special college. Thanks so much for joining us everyone. We will send out an email uh, in the next either tomorrow or by Monday with uh, a link to the YouTube recording of this. And if other uh, questions come up, uh, you can let us know in response to that email. And uh, we really appreciate your engagement. We had about, and, about 109 or 110 people at the peak in this. So it was really fun to see all of you in here. I saw a lot of familiar names. So thanks so much. And Sue, thank you for taking the time to do this. Um, Absolutely. We really appreciate the information. Yeah, thank you. All right, take care. Take Good night, care, everyone. Good night, everyone.